Hey guys, this is the EC Service Tech, and today I wanted to go over how an evaporator coil functions. All right, so this one's a vertical evaporator coil. All right, so the air blows in the bottom and comes out through the sides and the top, or it could also be used as a downflow where the air comes down, has to come through the coil, and go out down through uh, beneath. What happens is um, the actual humidity gets attracted to these fins, and then it just drips right down into the condensate pan take your uh, drain down from the lowest most spot anyway um, so how this thing works all right um, you have your suction line and your your liquid line all right so your liquid line comes in high pressure high temperature liquid refrigerant comes in hits the metering device which in this case is a thermostatic expansion valve all right and it turns into um, 20% flash gas and 80% liquid. Then it comes into the bottom of the evaporator coil, all right, as a 20% flash gas, 80% liquid, and it comes up to say the midpoint. All that time it's absorbing heat, all right. So I would say, like, say we can split this up into thirds and say that this bottom part is mainly liquid, okay. This middle part is completely saturated, okay. Saturated means it's liquid and vapor both exist at the same time, okay? Then you can say that basically the top third or so is where you should be turning into a complete vapor. And from there on, it's increasing in temperature after it's turned into a vapor, okay? So the vapor is actually getting superheated. The temperature increase above the saturation point. That's when it comes back out and it comes through the suction line back to the compressor again, all right? So that's how it works. So it's absorbing heat from within the building. As it's absorbing heat, all right, it's a, the evaporator coil is actually able to maintain temperature. All right? And uh, if you do not have enough airflow across the evaporator coil, so say your outdoor condensing unit uh, was a four ton and the thermostatic expansion valve was a four ton, it's going to be feeding too much refrigerant into uh, the coil. All right, and it's just not going to be able to um, be able to absorb as much heat as it's capable of. All right, but the biggest thing is you want to make sure that you have a superheat, and that's where the thermostatic expansion valve comes into play. All right, so um, thermostatic expansion valve actually has a little bit more play as far as the refrigerant charge goes um, because it's always trying to maintain 14 degrees of superheat. All right, so it reads the pressure right here. Okay. And then you have a bulb, which is actually also reading the pressure attached onto the suction line. All right. So um, basically, this whole process right here is the low pressure side. After it gets to here, this is high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant hitting the metering device, turning into a 20% flash gas, 80% liquid. For, say, the first third, it's absorbing heat and turning more and more into a saturated state. I would say maybe roughly right around the middle will be where it's almost like 50-50, 50% liquid, 50% vapor, until it comes all the way to the point where there's barely any liquid left and it's all vapor. And then from there on, it gets superheated, and the temperature increase in vapor form is where it comes out at. This is the superheat. If you were to have a... a this would be out of the evaporator coil box. And if you were to have a access port here in a temperature probe, that would be reading your superheat. What we're normally reading all the way back at the condensing unit or the heat pump, that is the total superheat. So if there's anything that's any temperature that's gained or lost in the suction line, um, that's why it's included in the total superheat. But that's what we normally use for charging units that have pistons instead of TXVs, all right? Uh, but we use subcooling back at the condensing unit to measure for uh, our charging procedure for this system right here. If you do not have enough airflow across this coil, the coil is going to start to freeze. All right, um, it's not going to have it's it's not going to be able to actually um, absorb any heat, and so the temperature is just going to continue to get lower and lower and lower until the thing turns into an ice cube. All right. So things to check for before checking a charge. Make sure that your filter is clean. Make sure you have good air coming out of the registers. The blower motor set to the capacity that this TXV and the outdoor condensing unit are. So say the uh, furnace was a uh, 042, which is a 42,000 BTU blower. And this was a 
um, 42, let's say, 3.5 ton TXV and a 3.5 ton outdoor condenser, then that um, you want to have at its highest fan speed, which will be the black. All right, so for a PSE motor, it would be black. For variable speed, you got to set the dip switches inside the unit all right, to get the maximum amount of airflow across this coil. Um, if you had a furnace that was larger and it had an 060 blower, that would be 60,000 BTUs, 12,000 BTUs per ton, and say this was still that 3.5 ton capacity, then, then you could say you could uh, kick down that, that uh, CFM, uh, cubic feet per minute value, to something that's closer uh, to 3.5 tons. All right, so I hope that helps, and I hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.